Basket weaving requires enormous patience, great manual dexterity, skill and knowledge of techniques, designs, and customs. Baskets vary from the materials and techniques used as well as the purpose for which it was created. The oldest baskets found in the Southwest were created more than 7,000 years ago and have survived today because they were protected from the elements in caves and alcoves. A group of nomadic hunter-gatherers that are referred to today as a desert archaic culture were likely the first to create woven baskets in the area of the Southwest. Other items like mats, sandals, and trays were also woven from the native plant materials. The knowledge of weaving was passed down generation to generation and tribe to tribe for thousands of years, allowing them to gather, store, and prepare food to eat. Baskets, as well as many other art forms, adapted and changed as more outside influence crept into the West in the late 1800s. Basket making was revived at the turn of the 20th century, but has evolved over the years. However, many traditional techniques remain a time-honored tradition as many artists still practice one of the oldest forms of art in the Southwest. What type of skills or traditions have passed down from generation to generation in your family? Desire for personal adornment is a universal human attribute that has been part of civilizations for countless generations. It's likely that the early inhabitants of the Southwest had jewelry and adornments made of rock, animal, and plant materials. While various materials could be used, some were held in higher regard like turquoise. It is still a highly prized stone that is often associated with sky, water, and to some symbolizes one of the six directions. Broken pieces of pottery were also fashioned into pendants to wear. Materials that already had a natural hole through the middle were chosen for adornment like fossilized crinoids. An oddity in the desert, shell bracelets and adornments were evidence of widespread trade as they were sourced from the coast in the Gulf of California. By the mid-1800s, adornments and jewelry made of glass, ceramic, or metal were introduced in trade. While Native Americans have been making jewelry since ancient times, silversmithing, however, was not introduced until the latter part of the 19th century. The Diné learned silversmithing from New Mexican Hispanos by the 1850s. Its city, Sani, was the first Diné accredited to making silver pieces in 1853. His students spread the scale by teaching others and even extending the craft outside of the Diné. Over the years, new techniques and styles emerged as more and more Native artists experimented with silver. By the 20th century, each tribe began to evolve their own techniques and create unique styles that incorporated Native symbols and materials. Hopi overlay, Zuni inlay, Petty Point, Navajo stamping, and tufa casting are examples of different styles that have emerged in the last century. Today's contemporary work shows that artists are free to merge their own inspirations with their skills and traditions that have been passed down for generations.
what traditional types of jewelry or adornments are typically worn in your family or culture. Hello, I'm Alyssa Ojeda, Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Grand Canyon Conservancy, the official nonprofit partner of Grand Canyon National Park. We work hand in hand with the Park Service to provide educational opportunities and digital programming to keep you connected to Grand Canyon. Thanks to your ongoing support, we're able to share this new series, History Behind the Arts, providing you an in-depth look at the Cultural Demonstrator Program at Grand Canyon. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the Cultural Demonstrator Program Coordinator, Grace Lilly. Hi, thank you for joining us today. We have the pleasure of talking with Laverne Gray Eyes and Luis Nez, Danae Weavers joining us from their home in Tuba City in Northeast Arizona. Luis and Laverne are mother and daughter who have made weaving a career and have passed on the skill of weaving handmade woven rugs to the next generation. Luis speaks very little English and we will have Laverne translate her answers for us today. Thank you for joining us today, Laverne and Luis. Hello. Luis, can you share a little bit about yourself and how you learned to weave? She said that she started learning her she started watching her mother weave at the age of 11 or 12, and she set up her small one, and she, she used to do a design on the, around the border, and she used to see, watch her mom weave the storm pattern, and she always wanted to learn how, so that's how she picked up on learning how to do the design, that's how she learned. For several months, she said she used to do the, um, just like um, a color stack on each other, like zigzag. That's how she learned. Several months later, she picked it up, yeah. And just another quick question. If she could explain just a little bit about the history or meaning behind the storm pattern. Just it is her grandma is the one who wove through, but she she had a different design. It was her grandmother that had her mother that had this design, and she said she never really explained what they were, but from what I've learned from it is. Um, these these are like the male female lightning right here and these are the the female and then the male and these they represent um they represent um like the water beetle and the centipede like they have like the four sacred kind of like represents like the four sacred mountains because they have four squares on each corner. And these are like uh, kind of like hailstorm. What represents the whole storm pattern is kind of like with uh, with a storm. <laughs> like what you what occurs during the storm, like lightning, hailstorm, yeah. And well, the lightning bolt goes four directions also. That's very meaningful. Thank you very much for sharing. Laverne, can you share a little bit about growing up and how your mother taught you to weave? I started, she taught me how to weave when I was 14 years old. 
Um, my first rug was a pictorial, which was, uh, it was a big deer and a butterfly. And that's how she taught me. It's something uh, she recently learned too. So I have not, I didn't learn this one. <laughs> I, I, I kind of um, come up with certain designs myself, but not particularly this design, yeah. And I started weaving at 14, and it was kind of like a casual weaving. It wasn't something that I'd done all the time. And uh, I think through high school, and I think I really started weaving until I was living in Farmington. Um, she, we still lived together during that time, so she, uh, she kind of helped me um, learn more about it. Yeah, and when she moved back, I, I did my own and I did my own design of um, um, how, even with our pictorials, we have different ways, our designs are kind of different. So that's how I learned from my mom, the pictorial rug. Well, it's great to hear that it's been passed down from generation and you can even learn new techniques and new styles and pass that on to the next generation as well. Luis, what materials do you use for weaving? Um, Steve, uh, she said that when she first learned how she has to, they have to literally have the sheet, they card the sheet, they, they shear the sheet, and they would card it, and they would spin it with the, like these spindles, and, uh, Afterwards, they used to dye them themselves, and that's how they, everything that they used, they had to make it uh, compared to today. Yeah, and that's how she, she had to do from the beginning. But I think now, uh, we, this one is vegetable dye. So some we dye, uh, some we buy them uh, from commercial dye from the uh, trading post. Laverne, do you use any different materials than Louise does? We usually use the same, the vegetable dye. And it's, um, if we're gonna, usually the vegetable dye, you come in, it comes in season. So sometimes we'll come down and do the vegetable dye together. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what type of materials you would use to dye? Yeah, the prickly pear, kind of like a make it a peak. Sometimes a pink, uh, pinkish, or a kind of like a lavender, yeah. And I believe that this one is, uh, this green one is made out of, uh, wonderful, like the tumbleweeds on the side. <laughs> there are a lot of tumbleweeds on the side, aren't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you won't run out of and them. It's a very nice color. <laughs> Good. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Laverne, can you tell us a little bit about the process that you go through to create your work? When we first start, uh, this is something that my mother and I both do. She's the one who taught me. Um, and we usually use our own loom as kind of like um, how we do our work. So we would um, lay down horizontally and we will get our, our like we usually use a pipe secure the pipe tightly and we will get our warp and we will kind of tie that tie one tie one in and we will go figure eight and it usually goes by at least eight within one inch it usually has like eight figure eights and you kind of have to keep it at a certain um, tension all the way to where the size of the loom the size of the rug you want, and and before you take it down, when 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 you're done with the the size you want, you you put your shear, your shed rod, and then your huddle, your huddle, um, the doyle in there, and then you um, on the edges, you you bind it with uh, another string. 
which we usually um, use it, we usually um, re, re spin it to make it kind of um, tighter and we kind of like braid it with it. And then we usually um, do the binding to it. this one we're using a two by four. And then we kind of um, bind it to the to the loom on both its ends. And then we usually put it on the, we usually tie it and secure it on a horizontal loom. So it sounds like getting the prep work together can be um, a little bit of work. And as you're getting your design ready and you start to weave, can you give us a time frame about how long it can take from maybe the minimum amount of time it's taking you to create um, a rug to the longest? She said that <clears throat> it used to take her about sometimes three months to finish one. Um, earlier, she when she used to have her sheep, she used to, she used to sometimes like in the morning take the sheep out and then weave later in the day. Laverne, how long is it taking you to uh, do rugs? It usually takes about two to three months also, at least six weeks. And it usually varies on what else I'm doing also. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, are you yeah. weaving eight hours a day or do you have other responsibilities you have to take care of as well? Well, with my mom, she said she used to herd sheep um, I think for me, it was mainly raising my kids. Well, um, I have a question for Louise. I was wondering, as she's woven from such a young age throughout her entire life, it's been decades, um, does she have any struggles that she's faced as she's been a weaver? Anything she'd like to share that she's been able to overcome? <laughs> She said when she was younger, <clears throat> when she used to hurt sheep, it used to take her longer. Now that she doesn't have any, um, she doesn't have to hurt sheep anymore. She says that what she has overcome is she can finish, um, she can spend more time weaving now and she finishes sometimes a lot faster. <laughs> and how about you, Laverne? What are some of the struggles that you've overcome as a weaver? I think one of the things that I had to overcome is making myself to, um, to actually sit back down. Once you start um, doing other stuff, sometimes it's hard to go back and sit down and weave again. I think that's one of the things do you feel like you get out of your groove sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Is there anything that particularly helps you focus on your work? Well, one thing that I, I really like is just quietness. Yeah, it's just, I, I just like to weep when it's quiet. <laughs> I was going to say, the natural sounds and peace help you kind of uh -huh. get yeah. into that group. <laughs> For you, Laverne, is, was there any, um, person that's really helped you stay focused or um, kind of help you feel like you've made more progress in weaving? I think one person is my mom um, because once she goes, you know, you just have to go <laughs> because some, there, there's times when we have to weave together and we would sit by side by side. And I'm left-handed, she's right-handed, so we know where, where I sit. <laughs> so that really encourages us sometimes weaving with her because there were many times that we would share the same loom. I would sit on one side and she would sit on the other side. So that's really encouraging um, to kind of tell you it's time to weave now. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to be able to do a project together with your mother and get to see the outcome. That's, that's something yeah. very special. Um, I have a question for Luis. Uh, do you have any memories of Grand Canyon that you would like to share as you've um, spent your time in the Southwest? I know that Grand Canyon can be a very special place and we've had you come up to demonstrate, but if you have any memories to share, we'd love to hear some. <laughs> Um, 
um, Bahan Sunday, um, Hashai Tao, um, Ban Sun Chasen Jimna, Hashi Dama Kaa, the wooden Jimna, she said that um, it does have a special place in her. I think she said a couple of years ago that her daughter Florence used to um, go to Grand Canyon for demonstration. And I believe it's been like four years since we started going. She said she really enjoys the place and uh, being in the area to be able to find some financially that Grand Canyon was able to help her. Can't wait to have you guys back up here again. I know that it's not the <laughs> safest time, but this is one way we can still share your um, amazing talents and um, stories. Laverne, does Grand Canyon hold a special meaning to you or do you have any fond memories of Grand Canyon? Yes, I do. When I was uh, younger, my, um, my grandma and my mom, they used to do uh, beadwork and we used to sell them at the Grand Canyon at the first, um, the first, the first entry of the rim. So we used, they used to sell um, their beadwork, and we used to just wander around and just look over the outlook. That was that meant a very, very special time to bond with my grandmother and other family members because it wasn't just us; it was other family members that did sell their beef work there. That was our first opportunity to sell. Well, I'm glad that you had that experience here at Grand Canyon that's given you that hope and um, opportunities throughout the years as well. And I had a question um, for Louise. What are you hoping that others know or understand about your Diné culture? <laughs> Um, she said she um tradition culture wise, um she really didn't she doesn't really have a, a whole lot of knowledge because uh her grandfather was a medicine man but he kind of uh left to do um her ceremony his ceremony and she was not totally involved so she didn't really it wasn't something that was carried down to her generation well i noticed that both of you are wearing beautiful turquoise does turquoise have any special meaning to you for some reason i, I, I like the older turquoise <laughs> Uh, she said that uh, she she does like turquoise. She likes it. Um, she likes to wear her turquoise. Yeah, I, I do love how um, you have such beautiful pieces. Were they made by anybody um, that were in your family or that you knew or passed down from generation? Well, um, this one, the pin she's wearing is, uh, it's my oldest daughter. Uh, it was it was something that was given to her when my oldest daughter got married. Usually if they're in a Navajo wedding, um, usually the, the husband, the new husband family usually brings gifts to the, the, to the bride's family. And that's how she got this pin. So, 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 so they have significance. And usually turquoise, it, it means a lot to the holy, uh, the net people. It does have a significance to them. Laverne, can you share a pivotal moment as your time as a weaver, something that has really stuck with you throughout the years? I think for me, I, I usually go to a prayer house in Farmington, New Mexico. And that's where um, uh, one of the the the, the, the gentleman who, um, who who runs that place. Um, I would go there almost like once a week. So I, the first time I went there, he asked me that Father God told you to 
kicked out of my rug. And I went home, and I kind of like, okay, Father, you know, this is what I do. You know, you want me to take it down? So I kind of kind of go back and forth with it. So the second time I went back there, and he said the same thing to me. And this time I was like, you know, you know how much this is? This is, you know, this is the source of my income. <laughs> So I kind of uh, debated with God again. The third time, <laughs> the third time, he said to me, you haven't taken it down. I said, no, I haven't. So that time, I came home and I took it down. I took it down. I said, okay, I'll be obedient to you, God. So I took it down and I just put it away. And... Uh, and then that's when um, I started going to uh, San Juan College. And I was able to uh, learn how to draw and learn how to paint oil paint. So the pivotal moment is when I had to learn how to draw my own um, animals or what I'm going to make. Um, and that's how I started doing my shoe game. I, I, I had to draw my own animals, and I had to do research on on it, and that's how I did learn how to, that's how my shoe game started. So the next question is for Louise. So she um, would like to share a pivotal moment in her time as a weaver, maybe when she learned a new style or technique. <laughs> She said the pivotal moment is when she knew, when she learns a new pattern, um, like when she first learned this one, and then she says she used to do um, saddle blankets, and then whenever um, she learned pictorial, said she learned a little over thirty about over thirty years ago. Uh, she learned from Linda Ned, who is. Um, her her young her younger brother's wife. Uh, they learned in Flagstaff, where my grandmother also lived. She said we they used to, we used to come together, and she used to teach us. She said those were the pivotal moments where she learned how to do the the trading posts and how she 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 learned how to make the animals. Um, so I was going to ask you, um, Laverne, if you have any words of wisdom or advice to share with other artists as you've been weaving, but also um, starting to branch out and do more paintings as well. I think I would encourage them to, um, I think one thing that I, there's a history behind um, all, all what we, um, like with the weaving or with other artistry, there's a history behind it. And it's something that's been carried from generation to generation. And just to encourage them that it is something that was, that they should treasure and hang on to and to encourage others to, to pick up and to learn and to teach their other to the next generation. Does Louise have any words of wisdom she would like to share with other artists? Um, <laughs> She says that she kind of um, narrowed down to one artist that she like. She 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 likes jewelry. Is what she's saying, and she she likes um, people that makes jewelry because she loves she likes jewelry herself, and that she she has a son that makes jewelry off and on, and his name is Bill Nance. Yeah, and just to encourage silversmith. Thank you guys so much for sharing all about your art. Well, we, these are some strange times to try and navigate with the pandemic and generations before us have gone through similar ordeals. Do you have any stories you've heard from your family or other uh, Diné people about how illness or pandemic may have affected them in the past and 
how they're getting through times today? She said that um, when the difference between now is there's more hospitals and uh, there's more uh, doctors. Uh, you hear more of people going to the hospital and getting well than um, when she calls it the red rash. When she, cause she said she got red rash one time, I think in 19, 1940s, they have uh, kind of like chicken pox. And she said that she got like uh, rashes that came. She said the difference between then is there was she never really heard about hospitals until she was like 18 years old. That's when she first heard about hospitals. And the difference between then, I, I was asking her if she had taken any medication or anything. She said, no, she, she didn't have any medication. When, but she, she noticed that how they were talking about how different people had died from the rash. It's definitely a struggle to be able to survive through this and not knowing if you had some of that health care that is an opportunity now to help more people survive. Laverne, these are strange times to navigate as well. Has the pandemic affected you and would you like to share what's given you some hope or inspiration to get through? We as Navajo people are resilient. Uh, we have gone through the smallpox, uh, the tuberculosis. So, and, and this pandemic, um, we have gone through it and we were, I, I believe the Native Americans are very spiritual people. Um, they, 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 they pray and they sing and um, uh, just, just their surrounding gives them strength. Awesome. And I believe that that's how, they, how they're able to cope. So um, this is an opportunity for both of you. Please ask Louise if there's anything else that she would like to share um, in this interview today with our virtual visitors. She says, thank you. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the doctors and the nurses who have experience with this pandemic and all the, they have helped us with like fire department 
nurses and the paramedics. Thank you for your support of everyone that's being helpful at these times. Um, are you guys interested in being contacted by visitors? And if so, uh, which way would you like people to be able to contact you? I would like to email if they want to email us. And that will be llbrayeyes53 at yahoo.com. Louise and Laverne, thank you so much for taking the time to share your generational knowledge, skills, and experiences of weaving today with us. It's an honor to have you be a part of our cultural demonstration program, and we appreciate your efforts in helping more people feel connected to Grand Canyon, its history, and its spirit. Thank you so much, and we can't wait to have you guys back. Thank you, Grace, and thank you so much, Laverne and Louise. It was such a fascinating interview. So Grand Canyon's cultural demonstrator program is made possible with support and grants from Grand Canyon Conservancy and Art Place America. To learn more about the artisans in this program, go to grandcanyon.org forward slash demonstrators and stay tuned for more history and behind the arts features on both Grand Canyon National Park and Grand Canyon Conservancy's social media pages. Thank you. Yeah.